Hi everyone and welcome to Wine 101 on the road. Cable Access 13 TV, Prescott, Arizona, USA. I am Dan Strauss, your host for this episode. Today we are just west of Paso Robles, California on beautiful Highway 46 at Sextant Wines with winemaker Stephen Martell. Hello. And owner Craig Stoller. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to meet both of you guys. Let's start with a little bit uh, about you and uh, your background, how you got into this industry. Actually, this would be a good question for both of you, actually. How you were drawn into this industry, uh, where you went to school, and how you wound up, Stephen in particular, right here at Sextant Wines. Sure. So um, I went to school at uh, UC Santa Cruz studying biology and agroecology with a focus on organic viticulture. Um, from there, I decided to spend a year in a vineyard uh, that, that farmed organically. Um, so I got a job at Clopepe Vineyards down in Lompoc, uh, Santa Barbara County. Uh, they produce super premium Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, I spent a year in the vineyard there. Uh, with that, I helped them out with their first commercial vintage uh, for Clopepe Vineyards and really fell in love with the winemaking side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, from there, um, I really liked the wines coming out of the Paso Robles area, uh, so I decided to come up here and search for a job. Um, I got a job at Summerwood Winery, mm -hmm. where I worked under Scott Holly there for four years um, and learned a ton from him, so a lot of hands-on learning there. Um, from there, I took off and did my own label for a number of years, which I continue to do. Um, but in 2010, decided to get a little more steady paycheck, and um, we have a mutual <laughs> friend, and I was looking yeah. for a job, and she had heard that uh, they were looking for a winemaker, so it kind of worked out, worked out nicely there. And so perfect, perfect. That ended me up here in 2010, and so from from then till now, this is our uh, our fourth vintage uh, making wine here, and so really, really great spot to be. Steve's been a great addition to our team. Uh, I grew up in Kern County. Uh, my dad's been propagating grapevines for about 45 years now. And so I spent a lot of time on the front end, I guess you would say, or the, uh, the, the uh, viticulture, where the vintage begins is our slogan at Sunridge Nurseries. And was exposed early on to fine wines and you know, wine was at the dinner table. It was a part of our everyday, uh, you know, tradition and uh, went to Cal Poly, studied horticulture, went, went back to work for the family business and that's when I really fell in love with wine. My, my first job was was to get out and uh, learn the people or learn the country, uh, the wine regions and uh, meet our, our vine customers. And, and so that was about 20 years ago. I, I knew at that time I wanted to be in wine and yeah, at the, at, at, we started importing French clones. Um, there was a whole new generation of selections that came out of France. And so my wife and I decided, wouldn't it be great to plant some of these new French clones here in Paso Robles, use the cuttings for the uh, prop for propagation in the nursery, uh, have some great days, maybe make a little bit of wine. That's <laughs> kind of how it started, and a little bit turned into a lot more. and, and uh, we're just loving the, the wines coming out of this region, and I think that you'll find them wonderful as well. You, your family had also a unique relationship, not only with the French, but the Spanish and Portuguese, and it was basically the same idea. It was involving certified wine grape selections and authorizing you to uh, 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 carry on the baton here. Yes, we have an Iberian program, so Spanish and Portuguese varieties that that have come in, and they're really different varieties that we haven't done a whole lot of work with, but uh, one of which is called Monastrel, and it's basically a, a Movedra clone. Mm -hmm. We're excited to be planting that here mm -hmm. pretty, pretty soon, but uh, there's some highly colored varieties that yield pretty good, but also do well in warm climates mm -hmm. that I think would be great for this area as well as the interior valley. Uh, either Stephen or Craig, um, I understand that Stoller has three vineyards in three different AVAs. 
What varietals do you uh, grow and uh, uh, where do they come from, please? So we have our cool climate vineyard down in Edna Valley. So we bought the old McGregor Vineyard. It was planted in 1975. And so we've got Chardonnay and Pinot there. Uh, and then we have RBZ Vineyards up here in, in Templeton, okay. Paso Robles, Appalachian, where we have all the new certified selections of uh, uh, Bordeaux varietals, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, as well as Merlot. Uh, and then we love Zinfandel, and so we've mm -hmm. got all the UC Davis clones of Zinfandel here, Primitivo, mm -hmm. uh, the heritage clones, or some of the heritage clones we planted. And then back in the mid 90s, my dad and I planted a vineyard for Mondavi oh. in uh, San Ardo. It's Monterey County. And uh, we grow some fabulous Merlot up there, as well as some Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, there's even a little bit of Syrah and, and Petit mm. Syrah mm. up there. So, different regions. That's what's great about the Central Coast is we have uh, different terroir, different, mm -hmm. different uh, climate that produces different kinds of grapes. That actually leads me to my next question. How does the climate here and the terroir affect the flavors of the bottom line, your great wines? Sure, yeah, I think it's, it's an ideal location to grow uh, certain varieties and actually quite a few different varieties grow very well here as well. So um, what kind of makes Paso special is the nighttime low temperatures and the daytime high temperatures. So that diurnal temperature swing mm -hmm. Uh, allows the fruit to get very ripe uh, during the daytime, but maintain the acidity with the cool nights. Um, and that as well as, you know, the very different um, kind of uh, terrain here. We've got uh, some steep hills on the west side, a little different soil types. Um, on the east side, it's a little flatter, a little more sandy soils. Um, so it's a very diverse growing region. We can grow all kinds of different grapes. Um, and do very well at that if, if the right site and the right varieties are chosen for those sites. Next question, when it comes time for harvest, do you harvest by hand? Do you use machine or does it vary with varietal? Uh, um, well, we do both Okay. and it really varies depending on the vineyard. Some vineyards aren't built to be machine harvested. Right, right. Um, and again, a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, fruit we source from our own vineyards are fairly small blocks, so it wouldn't really make sense to come in right. and get a machine and take three passes and be done. So, sure, of course. Um, and usually with those uh, small blocks, we tend to save those for our higher end wine programs. And so we really try to take a little extra care with those, um, hand pick them so that it's uh, nice clean fruit and the fruit we want to get off of that. Okay. How is this year's crop stacking up, especially in light of these guys here being in about the third year of drought and it being particularly warm? Yeah, I think um, with it being so warm and, and uh, low water this year, um, everything is ripening up very early. I see. Um, we're anywhere between two and four weeks early on, on certain wow. varietals. And I've kind of noticed an interesting thing with the chemistry on a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pH and the, the bricks are not really moving together like they have in the past. So um, with a lot of our red wines, the bricks are pretty high and the pH is low with, with still high acidity, um, which we'd normally see them more in sync. I see. Um, and then with some of the whites, the, the bricks are pretty low, uh, but the acidity is low and the pH is high. So it's kind of a flip-flop of what we'd normally expect. I it's see. An in interesting year. Um, you know, we'll see what that produces. We had to pick some whites earlier to maintain acidity and, um, you know, some of the reds we had to hang a little longer than we normally would in I order see. to get that acidity more in balance. Are the vintages uh, with sextant wines generally fairly consistent year to year? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. Most, most of the wines are fairly consistent. We're really noticing, um, you know, very consistent quality coming out of the, the certain vineyards and certain vineyard blocks. Okay. and. Over the last number of years, uh, with me working with the different blocks, I've gotten to know them and um, can really almost uh, predict in advance, okay, mm. these particular blocks are going into, you know, our top high-end wine, and maybe these blocks are going into maybe some of the uh, more value-priced wines. And so, I see. Um, yeah, we have had uh, fairly consistent uh, vintages. How does uh, Sextant approach 
sustainability and environmental issues, and that question for either of you. you want to speak a little bit about that. Well, we're uh, we're at a point where a pretty young winery, but uh, I would say we're fairly sustainable, and that we don't use too many uh, materials. We're not uh, organic by any means at this point. We do have some different diseases and pests uh, in the area, and vine mealybug is one that we have to treat for. But uh, I think we're stewards of the land, and we do the best job we can to take care of it so we can pass it along to the next generation. You can't really ask for anything more than that. Sweet. Well, it's time to move from the vines into the winery. We'll be right back. We have moved inside the beautiful winery here at Sextant with Stephen Martell and Craig Stoller. And are there things that make this facility unique? Well, this was a, a partially uh, done winery facility that was really kind of a, a spec uh, facility, if you will. There was a group of investors that would buy properties, build the properties out, and then sell them for, uh, for a profit. And when the economy got to be a bit challenging, uh, that investment group actually went bankrupt and the property went through foreclosure. But what we're left with here is, is the footprint that was, that was you know, okay. pre, pre, predestined. And so uh, it was a shell building. The foundation obviously was here, some, some, some block masonry, but the concept of having this fishbowl type winery facility where you can look down at the barrel room and, and see the barrels and look into the fermentation room and see the, mm -hmm. the, the, the tanks and fermenting going on is, it gets that interaction with the consumers that come in and I think that, I think it's been, it's been fun to watch people enjoy the, the process. It's very nicely done and has a very, very warm feel. The tasting room is gorgeous also and the ceiling is notable. It's notable. I can see that uh, maybe why the word sextant plays into this a little bit. Somebody likes the ocean. <laughs> so, anyway, um, Stephen, would you talk us through the winemaking process here at Sexton, please? Absolutely. So um, when we harvest, we harvest into half-ton picking bins. Um, the fruit comes in. Uh, we do a destemming on the fruit. We don't do any crushing. Um, so mostly whole berries in the fermentations. Um, and we have various sized tanks or fermentation vessels that we process into. Um, this is for red wines. Uh, white wines, we basically just press it, um, whole cluster, right into the tank, and that's where we do our fermentations. Um, red wines, we can ferment anywhere from um, half a ton in a picking bin all the way up to 75 tons in wow. Wow. one of our big uh, 18,000 gallon tanks. Um, and during the fermentation process, we do multiple um, processes during that to keep the juice in contact with skins as much as possible and also to supply um, air for the fermentation for the yeast. Um, so we do uh, a traditional punch down, um, we can do a traditional pump over where we take the juice from underneath the cap and spray it over the top. Um, and last year we implemented a, a new tool um, which is called Pulse Air. Okay. Um, they call it Numetage in, in France, where it was developed. Uh, basically takes a, either a probe or a fitting on the bottom of the tank, I see. and it injects a, a pulse of air, which creates a bubble that bubbles up to the top, it breaks through the cap, sprays some of the juice over the cap, and also supplies a lot of oxygen mm. in the air for the yeast there. So um, using all three different methods, uh, we, we um, take the fermentation through its fermentation process. Mm -hmm. Once it's either dry or close to dry, um, we then take, drain down all the free run and okay. press the rest of the, the must so we can get as much um, finished wine out of that as possible. Sure, sure. You brought up one word that leads to my next question. Do you use native yeasts or do you use cultured yeasts? We do a mixture of both. Um, depending on the lot size, usually the bigger lots, um, you know, just to be safe, we will use a cultured yeast. Okay. Um, if we're talking like, uh, you know, 20 ton lot or 70 ton lot. Sure, sure. Generally want to be safe with those. On the smaller lots that we can be a little more hands-on and, and manage a little closer, um, sometimes we'll do a, a three or four day cold soak okay. where it's kept cool. Um, after that, we'll let it kind of start fermenting on its own. 
and as long as it smells clean and is, is running like a, smelling like a good clean fermentation, we'll let that go native. Um, if during that period of time it starts to get a little VA or ethyl acetate mm -hmm. or any of these, um, you know, uh, non desirable <laughs> products, um, we will mm -hmm. come in and inoculate it then and get it warmed up and got it, got get it. that culture yeast to kind of take over the fermentation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what kind of barrels do you like to use and what level of toast on the barrels? Um, we use a mixture of French, American, and Hungarian oak. Um, really depending on the wine and the style of wine we want to produce mm -hmm. out of that. Um, for our Chardonnay, we do one Chardonnay um, called our Santa Lucia Highlands okay. Chardonnay. It's, it's more of a vanilla and butter style of Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we use um, uh, American oak, mm -hmm. Dump Toast American, medium plus toast Okay. okay. Um, with toasted heads. Um, and that's a great barrel also for some of our Zins. Um, with our Cabernet and some of our Rhone blends, I like to use more French oak and maybe some Hungarian oak in that. Um, I'd say on, on average, our, our average toast level is medium to medium plus. Um, we are using some heavy toast though as well. Okay. When it comes down to final blending decisions, final bottling decisions, is it solely you or is it a... Uh, uh, sort of a collaboration. Of I think it's a, it's a decent collaboration. Um, you know, Craig will tell me what you know how many cases of each wine we want to produce, and um, I'll go through and look at all of the wines we have available, and kind of start to work on these blends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we we may produce twenty different red wines, and you know out of that we have I think ninety different lots of red wine. And so, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge to go through. Um, I pretty much have to taste all the different lots and take some notes on it. Sure. And then kind of get an idea on paper what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I start with our highest end wine and work mm -hmm. my way down so I don't use any of that good wine in, right. in some of the uh, more value priced blends. Um, so it is, it is quite a bit of a process. Um, but I do go through, I taste, I put it together on paper. We trial it up, and then mm -hmm. I let you know Craig taste it, and our cellar master Josh, and and try to get uh, you know as many other tasters involved, so we can kind of get a you know dial it in perfect. I would think that the longer you are here and familiar with your babies, the wine, the vines themselves, the easier that's going to be to um, uh, maybe anticipate how they're going to come out. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this year is the first year we're really actually <coughs> doing some initial blending even in the fermenters um, I feel comfortable with certain vineyard blocks mm -hmm. and I know already which wines those are going into so I'll treat them that way I'll blend them together um, right away as opposed to in the past we try to keep everything separate as possible and you know then figure out where it's going to go later so I think with the experience with these different vineyard blocks and, and the different uh, lots of wine we can kind of anticipate sure, where sure. it's going to go and what we're going to do with it. So let's talk about the bottling process. Do you like tra traditional corks? Do you like screw caps? Does it depend on the varietal? This is an interesting question for owners and for winemakers because we often have people absolutely diametrically opposed on this. Yes, I think uh, <laughs> Cork, cork finish, I, there's a certain ritual of pulling a cork, and I think mm -hmm. that it kind of speaks to a quality. And, and uh, we have not made the leap from, from uh, you know, screw cap. On, we, we do mm -hmm. some screw cap finish on, or twist, I should say, on, on mm -hmm. whites mm -hmm. and even rosé, but we have not yet okay. done twist cap on <laughs> reds. Now, we have kind of our, our entry level Zinfandel, it's our mm -hmm. by the glass wine, and uh, we're, we're thinking about trying that for the next vintage okay. twist. Okay, okay, okay. Stephen, describe your style of winemaking. Um, I'd say it's, it's fairly hands-off. Um, we do source mm -hmm. some great fruit. Uh, the fruit coming out of our estate vineyards is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that in mind, I, I don't, need to do a lot of manipulation of the wine to make it a good finished product. Um, so that being said, you know, we do some native fermentations. We sometimes do native malolactic fermentations mm -hmm. if it's going. Um, tend to 
leave the wine in barrel without doing much racking on it. Mm. Um, we're doing a little more these days to try to clean it up a little bit before bottling, um, try to get some of that sediment out. Um, but beyond that, we don't do a whole lot of manipulation. It's just topping and keeping the SO2 levels up. Okay. Um, and then prior to bottling for the reds, we do not do any filtration on any of the reds or any fining. So mm -hmm. it's very, you know, hands-off style. I like to let the wine kind of be the star. I don't need to, you know, as, as long as there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and most of the fruit we bring in doesn't require any manipulation as far as acidulation or anything like that, we, we try to stay away from it and let the wine do its own thing. Perfect, don't fix it if it ain't broke, so to speak. Exactly. Um, our audience consists of many foodies, and one question we like to ask uh, owners and winemakers is what is your favorite pairing, food, wine, and if you have more than one, sweet, all the better. <laughs> oh, so many wines. And and they're also wonderful and and they evolve these wines as, they, as they've been in bottle they change and so uh, it's really fabulous I, i'd say our zinfandels are classic you know uh, to go with barbecue any kind of barbecue hamburgers pizza italian food our zin is uh, you know fabulous uh, i would say uh, another favorite pairing of mine would be the SLA chardonnay it has some very nice oak and malolactic to it and that might be good with something like a, uh, a grilled shrimp with a corn salsa. <laughs> uh, some of the bigger, richer wines might even go well with dessert, a chocolate dessert. So we do a blend called Night Watch, and it's Petite Syrah okay. with Zinfandel and a little Syrah. And it's a big, bold, extracted wine that would pair well with uh, chocolate truffles. Ooh. <laughs> I'd say I'd like to do a little addition to that. So we do a, a Syrah from Sea Canyon. <clears throat> which is a uh, very cool climate, has this great, nice, uh, spicy, peppery flavor to it. And I had that with a, um, a steak the other night with a peppercorn sauce on it, and it was awesome. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> what a great visit here at Sextant Winery. We want to thank the Stollers. We want to thank Steve Martell for their most gracious hospitality. Do come visit these guys. Wonderful people, wonderful wines. That's it for this episode. Uh, on behalf of Wine 101, see you down the road. Cheers.